uh, exactly three years ago um, for a job in the running industry. It was like a dream job for me. Uh, just through some connections within the running industry. I worked for this company, Run Sign for about 15 months. And I was fired shortly after going vegan for... Hello and welcome to the Vegan Luna podcast. I'm here with an incredible um, activist that I have uh, been really inspired. I watched a, a speech that he did um, on, the, on the global strike that we had fairly recently. And uh, it was very, very interesting because... And I have a little plus twist off that something wasn't mentioned today. The single greatest thing that we can do to curb our greenhouse gas emissions is to simply change our diet. And why that wasn't brought up, I don't fucking know. But it's really simple. Instead of grabbing the cow milk, you grab the almond milk. Instead of grabbing the beef burger, which is why the Amazon is being destroyed, you grab the Beyond Burger. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Deforestation, world hunger, climate change, A lot of people know about the impacts of the environment right now. They see the rainforest burning, they see the ice caps melting, they see the ocean rising, they see the acidification, they see the desertification and all those sort of things uh, that are really plaguing the environment, the massive hurricanes, the massive floods. And uh, we had a huge strike recently and a global strike, you know, they estimated about 4 million people were in this strike. Uh, and not a lot of people know exactly what they can do to impact the environment. And some people didn't probably didn't even know what they're striking for. They know like, Hey, I care about the environment. I want to get involved. How can I help? Hey, you know, do this strike. But what some people probably didn't realize is that there's a bigger impact that you can make, uh, on this, on the environment. Uh, and it's, and it's through your diet, it's through what you eat. And so, uh, the man I'm talking to right now, the man we're sitting down with right now, had a really, to me, a very inspiring speech uh, about how animal agriculture and eating animals and cheeseburgers and that sort of stuff really, truly affects the environment. And I was really inspired and I had to have him on because I love talking about the environment. But before we get started and before we get into that, um, I want to ask you five quick <laughs> questions. That's how we start the show off. All right, so question number one. What do you think uh, of the recent global strikes? Thinking, since we're talking about that, what did you think about that? Um, I think it's good that people are becoming aware of uh, serious issues. I think it's great that um, these strikes are globally unifying. So, you know, it doesn't matter if you're gay, straight, black, white, what language you speak, you know, what nationality you are, like it, it's a it's a globally globally unifying uh, thing, uh, and I think that it's great because people are actually off of their asses and away from their screen, their computers and their phones, uh, and there's you know a free flow of, of ideas and people are talking about issues that they wouldn't normally talk about because they're being exposed to different people. So I think it's good that it's happening. Uh, and uh, it's good that people are sharing it around the social media. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, thank you. And so question number two, what do you think it will take for us to get to a vegan world? What do you think that's going to take? Um, well, you know, I'm sure you've heard of like the rule of 3.5. Um, it, it's uh, a lot of the work is done by, uh, I believe this girl's name is Erica Chenoweth. She studied past social justice movements and, uh, you know, actions of, of the past with regards to the suffragettes and uh, the civil rights movement. Basically, it's once you get three and a half percent of the population doing continued actions and, and continued nonviolent demonstrations 
towards a certain goal, that's when you will reach a tipping point of it, of whatever they're pushing for goes. So we need, there's probably already three and a half percent uh, vegans in, in certain locations, but these people aren't activists and they're not out, you know, protesting. They're not out raising the voice. So we need to uh, inspire these passive vegans uh, to get involved. That's, um, that's what I think, we, you know, we need to do. Yeah, for sure. Absolutely. I, I couldn't agree more. And I think uh, a spirit of this podcast um, is, is helping to inspire others. It's, it's, it's talking to people like you. It's, it's talking to uh, people that are, being, that are out there, that are active, that are, are, are walking uh, the talk and, and doing what it takes and, and hearing different ways that you could do it. Um, sometimes people get really scared of the word activist, like, oh my gosh, I have to be a protester and out in the streets screaming me is murder. Like, sure, like that is a part of it. Um, but there's so many other things that you could do from social media um, to uh, cooking, to teaching, to, I mean, YouTube or podcast. There's a really a, a plethora of things that you could do for sure. All right, so question number three, who are your top three favorite activists, current activists? Um, I'm going to have to go with, um, and I'll probably catch a lot of shit from people um, because he's kind of a controversial figure, but um, Yarovsky, Gary Yarovsky. Well, I guess he's not active, but I got I to gotta plug him because uh, it was his speech that, that flipped me vegan, and I'm sure we could talk more about that later. Um, I'm really inspired by um, a lot of the women in the movement, and I think that, that we need to prop them up uh, because the face of the movement is very white cis male. I don't know if there's any way to get around that, um, but I'm really inspired by uh, some of the DXE ladies, uh, Priya Sahani, who disrupted Jeff Bezos earlier this year, who's facing felony charges out in Sonoma County, California. Um, she's just fearless, and I really like um, what she's doing and how she presents herself. And uh, recently, I'll, uh, I'll plug Cheyenne Denner, goes by uh, Naturally Cheyenne on, on social media. She just led a bunch of activists into one of the largest pig slaughterhouses in France, and they faced some um, violence from the, um, the slaughterhouse workers in that action. And that takes some serious uh, gall, if you will, to you know put yourself out there in these types of actions. So I'm I'm all about the the lady power in the movement right now, and I think we need more more of that, more people of color, more people that are uh, not me. <laughs> to, uh, <laughs> <laughs> that we need to be featured and we need to be talking about. Yeah, you just need to have a seat, okay? <laughs> yeah, exactly, right? I know, as I'm, as I'm on the show talking. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, it, it seems to be something that s some people are talking about within the community uh, and, and some people are upset about. So, and, and, I, and, I, and I get it. Um, I, but I also don't know if there is um, any, any way around it. You know, just with the way the world is, you know, it's, it's a, it's a white male world. That's what was built and uh, it needs to be dismantled. So I think one of the ways that we can dismantle that is to, um, you know, prop these, prop these ladies up, prop people of color up that are doing the same kind of work. Yeah. And ultimately end speciesism um, yep. as, as many believe is the root of all discrimination. Yep. Uh, 100%. Sure. All right, excellent. So, um, next question: What is the hardest thing about being vegan? Um, well, I don't really deal with it much anymore. But I did when I first went vegan. I first went into activism. Was like dealing just a lot of the blowback and the bullshit from family and, and longtime, longtime friends. And I've kind of uh, set some pretty hard boundaries now. So I don't really deal with that much anymore. But, um, you know, initially it is scary and there's a lot of gaslighting and a lot of people make you feel badly for, for doing what you're doing and, and saying what you're saying and how you're saying what you're saying. It's like damned if I do, damned if I don't type of thing. Um, but um, at least initially I think that, um, you know, dealing with, with blowback from people that you've known a long time can be hard, but once you move beyond that, set some boundaries, it's, you know, it's good. 
you attract good people, you attract positive vibes, and um, it's not something you should worry about in, in the long term. Yeah, it ha- I mean, really, in the long term, I mean, it has nothing to do with the animals and, and what we're fighting for. And you also really realize who your real friends are. Uh, yeah. You know, if someone is going to not, they're not my friend anymore because I don't want to harm animals and I want to help <laughs> other people to not do it. It's right, like, right. what, that why were we is. friends in the first place? I don't even know right. why. Right, it's pretty right, crazy. Right, right. Yeah. yeah. All right. Cool. Um, yeah. I, I mean, I definitely agree. Social pressure, I think is the word that, that, that you're looking for um, there is very true and it can be very tough. Um, if you're, if you're very attached to certain people and you don't want to hurt them or hurt their feelings or, or stuff like that, it's going to really slow down the progress. And, and I agree with you. I, I always tell people that is the hardest thing uh, is the social pressure. And, and that's why even today I had someone that was asking me about, Oh, I, I, I want to give up dairy. I finally going to do it. I've been listening to everything that you're saying and I'm, and I'm so happy for you, but I'm so hesitant just to give everything that they're asking for. I have a lot, I have a few more questions. Like, why do you want to give up dairy? Like, like what's the reason, you know, like, have you seen the videos? Have you seen like yeah. what happens? Like, I don't want to just give you a great recipe and then like you cook some good meal. And then like three weeks later, like you're like, mm, I guess it's not for me. Like that's, right. that's not what I want, you know? So it's about understanding fully. So it's always, even, even I saw uh, Greta on, on the daily show with Trevor Noah. And when he asked, well, what could people do about it? And you're like, yes, tell them, tell them what to do. But really her answer was honestly a very good answer. And it's, it's really yeah, what it's I tell a lot of people. Do, right? She said, she said specifically do the research. That's what she said. Do yeah. some research, look into this, you know, like you'll find a lot of the answers that you're looking for. And, and I think that it was a good answer. I mean, she could say a lot of things, um, but I think it was a good answer. Yeah, absolutely. All right. So next one I have is uh, last question. So what is something that you thought was going to be hard about going to vegan, but it actually really wasn't that hard. It was kind of like maybe pretty simple, but you thought um, this would be a big hurdle for just, me. Uh, I mean, just like the food thing, you know, I mean, hear that all the time it's oh it's, it's just so hard or you know i don't know what to eat or whatever and it's like fuck for the first like two weeks i just ate beans out of a can like you know <laughs> it, it, it's it, i ate a ton of bananas you know before i started really cooking like just eat raw stuff it's not a big deal like it's it's a lot better to just eat some cheap meals than not pay someone to stab an animal like fuck you know just do the right thing <laughs> <laughs> yeah um so yeah i would just say like just just eating in general it's not as hard as you think and depending on where um you live i mean i don't want to get into the debate of like the impossible burger or whatever but like fast food options are having plant-based options fast food restaurants are having plant-based options now um you know mexican restaurants are some of my favorite places to order from um if i'm out and about like even the hole in the wall like family owned ones you know you get veggie fajitas um Indian restaurants, you know, a lot of the dishes are already vegetarian and can easily be made vegan. So it's just, it's just not difficult. And the whole convenience thing is just an excuse. So yeah, it's not hard. That's misconception. Yeah, for sure. All right, great. So uh, that's the quick vegan questions. Thank you very much. You did great. So yeah, tell us a little bit about yourself. Who are, who are we talking to? Who is this guy? Um, my name is uh, Curtis Vollmer. Uh, my I go by Curtis Anthony on Facebook. That's just like when I made Facebook back in college, that was the name, and I just hadn't changed it. Uh, so, God, I guess um, I, could, I could talk for a while, but I'm 32 years old. Uh, I went to school in Michigan, at Eastern Michigan University. I was a track and field athlete um, through college. I ran a 406 mile. Um, I wow. still run quite a bit. Yeah, um, graduated in 2011, kind of just bummed around my college town for a couple of years. 2013, 2014, I took a volunteer position in Honduras teaching uh, math and science. I went back to Michigan 2014, 2015 to, um, I started working in phones. I realized I didn't really want to teach, just wasn't a whole lot of money in it. Uh, 2015, 2016, I was living in Arizona, managing a store. 
And then I moved to Richmond, Virginia, which is where I live now, uh, exactly three years ago um, for a job in the running industry. It was like a dream job for me. Uh, just through some connections within the running industry. I worked for this company, Run Sign for about 15 months. And I was fired shortly after going vegan for um, promoting veganism at work. Yeah. And yeah, I actually tried to, they offered me a lot of money to keep my mouth shut about the issue. They offered me 20 grand in severance to kind of just shut up and go away, which I turned down. So I've never been one to like shut up about something if I thought it was wrong. And I didn't win that case. They, the legal system threw my case out on like a filing technicality on my end. Like I'm not a lawyer. If I had to do it over again, I, you know, I might be able to at least take it to court. But uh, my case got thrown out. Kind of caused some uh, storm with them online. They had to remove some of their Facebook uh, reviews because I got the big community gang up on them. Um, that's, <laughs> I could talk about that whole thing with my old employer for quite a while. Um, but yeah, I got, I got fired in January of 2018 from my job in, uh, in Richmond and then pretty much the next nine months I had a bunch of money saved up from that job. I was just doing activism, traveling around, meeting people. And then for about the last year or so I've been back selling phones and doing activism in my spare, spare time, you know? So that's kind of my uh, life since college, if you will, quick and, quick and dirty. Yeah, and so you go by um, Skinny Vegan on Instagram. What's up with that? So it used to be, um, I, you know, I've, I've been in like a video gamer like off and on my whole life. And uh, my gamer tag used to be Skinny Jeans, but the it was G-E-N-E-S. Uh, you know, for like the last 10 years, that was my gamer tag on Steam or Xbox or whatever. And, you know, once I went vegan, I was like, ah, I need to change this, you know? So I just, I just, that was just the gradual, uh, the progression of the, of the social media handle, if you will. All right, cool, brother. That's awesome. So I like your, I think that's really interesting. You went to Honduras. I'm sure that was an amazing experience, uh, getting a chance to see other countries. I, I will be a huge advocate for. I've, I've seen quite a few countries now and anyone that hasn't been a chance to see a new country and it gives you a whole nother perspective. Yeah. Uh, no matter where it is in the world. I mean, if you go to some place that's new, that's foreign, that you've only heard about or saw on a map and you see the way people live and the way people treat each other and, and how culture is, um, it gives you a whole new profound uh, perspective on the world, uh, even if it's just one new country, it just opens your mind to, to so many different things. I think that's really cool. Yeah, absolutely. So um, kind of one of the, even before I was vegan, one of the things that I advocate for when, when I talk to people, when I have like good discussions with them is to always remain uncomfortable. Like if you're, if you're, if you get into a place where you're just comfortable, and you're not really learning new things and you're not meeting new people and you're not being challenged on anything. That's like when you're, you may as well be fucking dead, you know? And that experience that I had in Honduras, it was like a huge culture shock for me when I first got there. And I almost actually left because I just, I just thought it was kind of, you know, it, it was just culture shock. It was just, it was textbook culture shock. Yeah, I've exactly. At. That's what it is. Yeah. And, um, uh, yeah, actually, like, while I was there, like, I, it was, like, four months after, I was, like, hey, I'm going back in the middle of the year, you know, this is, just isn't for me, and, like, the night before I was supposed to go back, I just, like, had an epiphany, I was just laying in bed, and I was, like, no, like, it's only six more months, I'm here for a year, like, suck it up, and I ended up staying, and it was, you know, a great experience for me, and uh, I've actually, I've actually since went back, and just, uh, just to chill at the school, and, uh, you know, connect with the kids that I was teaching and I got my scuba certification on the island off the coast. So nice. yeah, cool. Definitely recommend people to um, always kind of push their, push their comfort zone, push their boundaries. And uh, that's how you, you know, that's how you grow. Yeah. Excellent. So I want to know now, uh, tell me 
why would you decide to cut out all animal products? Why are you, why are you going to be part of the, the 1% of people that aren't eating animal products? Why do you want to be different? Why do you want to, why do you want to make a change um, for yourself and for others? Why did you do um, that? I mean, it was, it was pretty much after I heard the term um, speciesism. Like I heard the term speciesism and heard it explained and it just made complete sense. Like, yeah, that's discrimination. I don't support discrimination. So therefore I should probably be vegan. I didn't really have an argument against it. I didn't really feel like I'm, um, obviously it is, we are part of the 1%, but I didn't really feel like it was like a huge change in my, in my values. I mean, uh, the values were already there. I just, you know, we hear this all the time, align your actions, align my actions with my values. So I mean, I'm not doing this to be different. I'm not doing this to, um, you know, rub people the wrong way and, you know, doing this for, for the animals, for, for the victims. It's really simple. Yeah. And you said that you, you had seen the speech from uh, Gary Yarofsky. Yeah. Uh, and was that, was that one of the first times you heard that term or, or where did it start? Like, yeah, are you talking about like my my journey to veganism? Yeah, or, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So, um, it's a, it's actually interesting. Um, I've told the story a few times. So when I was when I was living in Arizona before I moved to Richmond, where I am now, uh, some buddies of mine had this like BLT night thing. You know what a BLT sandwich is? Yeah, of course, bacon, lettuce, tomato. Bacon, lettuce, tomato. Every Tuesday night, my buddies used to have this BLT night in in uh, in Arizona, in Flagstaff, where I was living. And it was, it was a great time. Like, you know, it brought everyone together, you know, food is a social thing and there were beers and he had a hot tub and yeah, it was super fun. And so I moved to Richmond and, um, got in with the running community, um, had a nice apartment there and was like, yo, I need to bring this BLT night thing to, to Richmond. So yeah, I was doing that for about six months in first Tuesday, in November, 28. 2017, um, people are on their way over to my apartment for the BLT night. And I go to YouTube to like put on a playlist, like a mix of music. And the best speech you'll ever hear, Gary Yarofsky, comes across the feed. And I hit play. And I'm watching like five minutes of it. And I'm like, oh shit, like this guy's good. Like this guy's, like, this makes a lot of sense. I, I, you know, I like the way he talks and then people started knocking on my door. So I put the music on, had everyone in, had the BLT night, everybody left. It's like 11 o'clock. I grab my laptop. I go lay in my bed, push play. It's like 1230. The speech is over with. I'm laying in bed I'm like, fuck, you know, and then woke up the next morning and that was it done instantly overnight. So that's how that happened for me. Yeah, that's, that's a, it's very powerful. And, and when you think about that speech, the one thing I, I like about the speech um, the most um, is that it covers a lot of bases and it covers a lot of areas. So it isn't just like, you know, I'm going to talk about some health or I'm going to talk about um, the ethics or the environment. He really covers everything. Um, in that speech. And I, I even love the small part that he does where he talks about just some of the food. And he's just like, look, this is, I like this one. And he's like, I'm not going to tell you shitty foods. I eat this. Like I've tried a bunch of, a, a bunch of yeah. bad ones. And I like his line where he's like, you ever had bad pizza or bad right. Chinese food, you know, or yeah. bad pizza or whatever? Like, of course, like there's bad yeah. vegan food, like absolutely. <laughs> and, and so I love that part. And, and even just the food part, and him just showing some of the items and, and you look at them and you just think like, okay, like I've never seen that one. And there's, there's some, it's kind of old. So there's some older ones and obviously we've come a long way since then. Sure. Uh, but yeah, that, that speech is, is so powerful and so influential. And I like, there was a little story I heard about how these two, I think it was two guys and they were in Israel and they, they were like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. People need to hear this. They translated it into Hebrew. And mm -hmm. they really did everything they can to spread this message. 
And part of, I don't know if you know, you've heard about um, Israel and like the vegan movement there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's very, yeah, it's, I think it's like the most vegan country in the world, right? Yeah, it's like 10% or Ooh. something crazy like that. Yeah, it's either that or Germany or I'm not sure. Yeah, but they're way up there. Yeah, and part of the biggest reason is because of that speech and how it is yep. spread like crazy and the connection that they have to being victims, you know, and the yep. connection he makes to the Holocaust. And then he did, he, he was brought over there because yeah. people wanted oh, to yeah. hear him. I've watched all of his, all of his stuff, you know, and yeah, he's, he was on that lecture tour and everything over there. Um, yeah, he has, a, I mean, he has a huge reason why Israel is, uh, is the, the vegan Mecca, if you will. Yeah, yeah great I, stuff. Went to, I went to Tel Aviv, Israel, uh, which is um, called the vegan capital of the world um, at the time. I don't know if it is now, uh, but it was just amazing to see. I think one of the best burgers I had was there. They had this cheese that they make there, um, not in the restaurant. Like it's, they make it in Israel. I don't even remember the name of it, uh, but that cheese is just still to this day the best vegan cheese I ever had. And uh -huh. some, people, some people say that the part of the reason that the vegan movement did so well there too is because in, in kosher, you can't have um, like meat and dairy in the same meal or like combined. Like you can't just have a cheeseburger um, if you are Jewish, right? So, uh -huh. so because, because a vegan meat is not beef, and vegan cheese is not dairy. Oh. You can have cheeseburgers as a as a vegan and and get away with it. Um, yeah. So it's a really they they believe that that also helps, <laughs> which is pretty interesting. Well, yeah. huh. I didn't read that. That's, that is funny. That's interesting. But if you have the chance to travel, uh, I highly recommend Tel Aviv. Amazing, beautiful people are so nice. It's right along the beach. It's just gorgeous. Uh, and it's yeah. relatively safe. I'm in the Middle East. Um, I, haven't, I haven't seen any um, crazy things live um, since I've been here. It's actually, I don't even lock my door sometimes. It's safer than, it's safer, really? than, it's, I, it's safer than the city I was living in San Diego, um, in Kuwait. Oh, yeah. Like, yeah, no yeah, joke. Yeah. I hear gunshots and sirens and the windows have bars on them. And that's San Diego. That's not like, <laughs> it's not like Compton or whatever, or some it's, other it's Chicago. So it's just so like the United States is just so segregated, like even within cities and neighborhoods, it's so segregated. So, which is sad, but way it is. Yeah, for sure. All right. That's awesome. I love, I love your story. And I, I like how simple it is because it's not that complicated. I mean, I could tell my story in a long way, but if I really just boil it down, it's really just a couple simple things. Right, uh, yeah. yeah. So, and I was the same way. I went overnight. It was, I watched What the Health. So that's what it was for me. Okay. I watched What the Health. I was super sick. And then I said, let me try this. Tried it, got better. And I was like, why would I go back? Like, I feel so good. Right. Uh, yeah. So that's really how it happened for me um, in a quick nutshell. So um, I want to hear about your big thing that you guys, that you're doing right now is your activism. What are you doing for the animals and how are you active? What are some of the activities that you do? Um, so, uh, man, I'll, I'll do like pretty much anything and everything. Uh, I organize, well, I've been trying to, I've been kind of slacking recently, but I'm the community organizer for DXE in the Richmond area. Uh, so, um, I'm a super proponent of the disruptions, you know, the grocery store disruptions and restaurant disruptions, especially that coupled with social media. Some of these, these posts have a chance to go viral. Um, and start a lot of conversations and you know, they rub people the wrong way. Um, but that's the goal. Like if we, if, if killing and eating animals was a normal thing to do, there would be no negative reaction. People wouldn't feel triggered. People wouldn't feel uh, like you're attacking them or, or like they're doing something wrong because if, if they weren't, then it wouldn't be, there wouldn't be anything there. Uh, so, yeah, I really uh, like the disruptions, you know, especially coupled with social media. Um, did you want to, can you explain, you want to say something? Yeah, can you explain DXC to yeah. maybe some listeners that never heard DXC and, and why yeah. disruptions? Some people think, really quick, some people think, um, uh, for, for the record, I'm all for DXC, like 100%. I haven't participated because it's not available yet in my area, but I'm yeah. going to 100%. Uh, and so... I'm reading a book right now called This is an Uprising. Have you heard of that book? Yeah, I've heard, 
haven't read it. I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm aware. Yeah, yeah I, it's, I, it's I, about direct action, right? Say it again. It's about nonviolent direct action. Yeah, exactly. It was recommended by uh, that vegan couple, which they do a lot of good. Okay. Yeah, yeah they I do. saw I saw Natasha um, post it on her story, and I was like, I'm gonna get that one. That one looks interesting. But yeah. DXC, um, it. it, it they, uh, they center a lot of their, their action around that. And I just want to share what some people think. Some people think that that is one annoying. Some people think that that is um, inconvenient. Some people think uh, that it's ineffective. Uh, whatever people think, I want you to kind of clear up um, kind of the purpose of that um, and why that, why that movement does so well. Yeah, so um, DXC for people that are, you know might be listening or might not be aware stands for Direct Action Everywhere. They're a um, uh, nonviolent uh, grassroots organization that founded in Berkeley, California, and they have um, splinter chapters uh, all over the world. And they uh, draw heavily on uh, tactics of of past social justice movements and leaders uh, such as um, Gandhi and Dr. King and um, the suffragettes. So they're, they're partaking in nonviolent direct action. So, you know, going into a grocery store, uh, causing a scene, doing speak outs, uh, holding signs. This is very confrontational, nonviolent though, obviously. And um, I think the, what made the most sense to me is that I've been out to Berkeley a couple of times now for the big conferences they have or conference that they have every year. And they quote, um, you know, Dr. King, and he has this term called negative peace and negative peace is peace or tranquility in the absence of justice. So you have people in a restaurant dining on body parts this is a place where negative peace exists. It's peaceful, it's tranquil from the outside, but this is a place of violence. People are consuming death and violence. So when you're going into these establishments and doing these speak outs, you're just bringing that um, you know, injustice to the surface. It's already there, it's underneath. People are unaware of it, you're just bringing it up here and now that it's up here and people are aware of it, they are now forced to take a side. They're now forced to, or at least think about the issue that they hadn't been thinking about. Um, so, in, in, yes, of course, there's always gonna be probably more than half the vegan community that doesn't wanna partake in this. It's just the way it is. But looking at the civil rights movement, the same shit was happening. Most of the people, and this is something that a lot, of, a lot of people think that like all black people were totally for Dr. King and totally for uh, uh, Malcolm X and their tactics. No, it was a very small percentage of people that were doing those sit-ins, that were doing those strikes. Like these were very brave people that were doing these. And even most of the other activists or civil rights campaigners were not partaking in these things. So, um, we all know collectively, looking back on it and, and seeing photos of these sit-ins and seeing photos of these marches and these protests, we know 100% that these people were doing the right thing, right? Like these people were brave. They were the ones that made the change. They were the ones that you know were in the media that got people talking. Um, so there's no reason to think that this movement with animals would be any different. So. We need to definitely support. If, if you don't want to do it, if you don't want to partake in these actions, fine, I get it. Like, it's not for everybody. Like, do something else, and I'll talk more about other things that you can do. But don't shit on these people. You cannot do that. You have to support it. Um, it. It really hurts the movement as a whole when you have vegans or activists telling other activists of what they're doing is wrong. Like, that, we, can't, we can't be doing that. So you're not into the DXC stuff, if you're not into disruptions, if you're not into, you know, really, you know, forcing the issue, fine, don't do it. I'm not going to condemn you for not doing it, but don't condemn the people that are putting themselves on the line um, in these actions. So that's kind those, of my... Uh, yeah, because those are very high risk. 
um, you can you can be arrested, uh, you can be assaulted. Um, even the the one girl I'm forgetting her name right now, but I'm sure you know you know got shot at um, and was bleeding. Yeah. Yeah. So so yeah, m- mythical Mia. Yeah, that's what it is. Yep. And so like these things aren't aren't easy, and it's not easy to to do. And and the least that that we could do. Uh, the very least is to support them and to share it and to to spread the message and and support it in any way we can. I I definitely agree. All right. So what else do you do? So we got the DXE and that's amazing. Um, I love that. Um, Yeah. So I have, um, you know, one of my good buddies in the era is an organizer for Anonymous for the Voiceless. Um, Another type of, um, it's not necessarily direct action per se. It's just a static street demo. I'm sure you're aware the people that are listening are not aware of what Anonymous for the Voiceless is. Um, they're basic, it's basically a street demonstration where people are holding laptops and TVs displaying slaughter footage. And people walk by and people stop and we try to have conversations with people and, and try to get them to lead themselves to the, the vegan conclusion on their own. These conversations uh, are very powerful, especially again coupled with social media. If you have people, you know, shooting video, these type of things, and I've recorded some of these conversations and have some of them on my um, YouTube, Instagram page. Uh, I'll also do um, some of my own uh, interviews. I've got the um, the VR headset with the Samsung phone, where it straps people into a like a first person view of a pig or a chicken or a cow in a slaughterhouse, and I'll interview people while they do that. I've got some of those videos online. Uh, what else? Obviously, like the protests and the marches, uh, I partake in those. But um, yeah, I mean, anything, anything, and everything, um, I'm in for it, and um, I support it. Again, uh, everybody needs to support everyone in their endeavors, in whatever they're doing. Um, but but even even if like you're really shy, you don't want to do anything like that. Like you can you can be an activist just with social media, just sharing. The videos from the slaughterhouses and, and that's all it takes for some people i've heard many people that that went vegan after viewing a video that someone shared so uh everybody can do something and we should be doing something yeah so tell me a little bit about this last one the most recent one and what kind of action did you do in the in the global strike yeah so there was a you know a climate strike it was the first time ever in Richmond that uh, like the Extinction Rebellion or, or and or Greta's movement had hit um, Richmond. So I was really excited about it. And I had like maybe five or six of my, you know, vegan activist friends that showed up and we had signs. We showed up beforehand and I had some outreach cards and we were walking around and having conversations with people about animal agriculture. We did the march and then there were some speakers at the end. And uh, I actually lended my megaphone to the people that were doing the, the speak outs because they were, they didn't have a very good megaphone and I have this like giant one that I have. So I gave the megaphone to the, the organizers and then I pulled one of the organizers aside and I was like, hey man, like I noticed like there's been some speakers before the march and during the march and there's been like three people talking now. Is anybody going to say anything about, you know, animal agriculture? And I wasn't sure if they were going to be like, what do you mean? Like, whoa. Or like that guy in Cowspiracy when he's like, what about it? Like, what about right. animal? Like, right, exactly. Like, you know, I've, I've just from like talking to other people, uh, other activists and, and seeing other stories, you know, online, I've seen, it seems like a lot of the organizers for these things have no fucking clue the impact that animal agriculture has, which just totally boggles my mind. Um, come to find out that the guy is a uh, vegetarian that I was talking to. And he's, you know, he was like, Hey man, you know, we have this whole thing planned and um, you know, I'd love to connect with you. And I agree with you. Something should be said, but you know, we have everything, you know, already planned out and you know, we don't want to, you know, and I get it. Like I, if I was in his position, I probably would have done the same thing. Like, I don't know this guy. I'm not having to speak out at our thing uh, type of deal. So after all the speakers were done and people were, you know, just about to just disperse and walk home, whatever, I grabbed a megaphone and did like a 90 second 
speak out about animal agriculture, you know? Um, I had an audience and everybody there supposedly fucking gives a shit about the environment. So they're a prime audience to, to at least plant some seeds. And yeah, so I just did a quick speak out on, on animal agriculture and asked people to uh, look into the, into the issue because all, the whole March they were just talking about fossil fuel industries and the corporations and this person and that person and that person. It's like, what about this person here? Like, we all have a part in this too. So, yeah, I mean, any time and all the time is a, is a good time to, to, to speak out, to, to say the right thing, even if it makes you feel uncomfortable, you know? Yeah. Fucking so, so tell me some of the things that you shared with them and, and, and for people that don't understand that how animal agriculture does in fact affect the environment, um, tell us some of the things that you, you shared with the group yeah, that you shared in the past. Yeah, I mean, like, the, the, the speak out was only like 90 seconds long, but, you know, I talked about how, um, you know, deforestation, desertification, ocean dead zones, um, wild species extinction, world hunger, uh, and all the, these issues are all directly a result of global animal agriculture, raising animals for food. I think one of the last statistics I saw is that, like, 60% of the animals on earth are actually the animals that humans breed just to kill for food. And uh, 36% is humans and 4% are wild free living animals. That's absolutely insane. Absolutely insane that we're clearing off all these, all this land, all these forests, cutting down all these trees to make room for cows and pigs and chickens. It's fucking crazy. And um, people don't, people aren't aware of this. People don't know. They just buy the shit from McDonald's or Burger King or the grocery store and are completely oblivious. And it's not their fault. It really isn't. I mean, I, I, was, I was a victim of the system for 30 years of my life. Um, but once you're aware, like you can act on your awareness and you can make choices that reflect information, reflect knowledge, you know? So, um, yeah, I just wanted to, I was just trying to uh, plant some seeds. And um, as people were leaving, I had some outreach cards and I, you know, gave them to people as they walked by. And for the most part, everyone was really receptive. And actually, like, I had to stop a couple times during the speak out because people wanted to, like, cheer. So, yeah, it was good. Um, it was good. And I actually had a longer conversation with one of the, organizers on the way home we talked for about 10 20 minutes and he's like yeah man like we should meet up we have these meetings every um every two weeks where you know, we talk about ways we can improve certain aspects of you know what we're doing and he he admitted that he hadn't watched earthlings and he hadn't watched dominion and in my mind i'm like you're already you, are, you know what these documentaries are He's like, yeah, I know, and, and I'm kind of just delaying it. I know that it's probably going to – he said I should be vegan. I know that. So that's good that the, uh, one of the climate organizers in Richmond knows of this issue and is open to – he said he was open to hosting a screening with everybody of Cowspiracy and or Dominion, which is probably a lot further along than some of these other – uh, climate organizers or climate marches are, you know, like I said earlier, there it seemed to be like there was a lot of places around the world where they weren't even talking about it. Or they didn't want to talk about it. Yeah, and that's not uh, uncommon. I know that one of the huge uh, climate studies that was done by the Oxford University, uh, where they looked at the impact of, um, you know, animal agriculture and the environment and that sort of stuff. And uh, one of the best studies that you could find out there, uh, you just search the Oxford study, Oxford animal agriculture, or however you want to search for it. Oh, it's first like, and I always, always cites that one, yeah. Yeah, one of the lead, um, or at least a few of the guys that were in charge of that operation went vegan because of the research that they found. So in the middle of research, they're like, holy sh, like we, I, uh, we need to change because- because like, I don't want to be part of this anymore, but some people don't get it. And I want you to help them understand 
um, at least a little bit more. Um, and they don't get it for, for multiple reasons, whether they haven't looked into it, they haven't thought about it. But like, let's just tackle something like, let's say the rainforest. Like why, how is animal agriculture connected to the rainforest? Yeah, so um, I'm, I'm pretty sure Brazil is either number one or number two exporter of beef, which, you know, beef is a societal euphemism for murdered cow flesh. And in order to uh, export all of this beef, you need vast amounts of land, you need vast amounts of soy and wheat and whatever else you need to feed these animals, which means you have to destroy native rainforest where native people, humans live there, uh, native animals, wildlife live there. Uh, and these trees that are being cut down are actually uh, a carbon sink, which helps, you know, keep our planet cool. So by eating beef or an any animal products, because a lot of this uh, wheat and soy and whatever is being grown in the Amazon is shipped around the world to feed the animals that people eat. When we're eating animal products, we're, we are active participants in the destruction of our own planet, of the rainforest. So that's, that's what people need to, to understand. And they need to understand that they can stop right now. They can stop right now and start helping. And it's so simple. So the fires in the Amazon rainforest were there to clear the land because it's faster yeah. and more effective and easier. Right. Yep. And, and something that some people don't know about the trees and you talk about the carbon sink is not only do they absorb the carbon and they store it. And the longer that they're alive, obviously the more carbon they have stored uh, through their lifetime and their life cycle. And they could tell how old a tree is by drilling in and seeing like the circles yeah. of the carbon, right? The carbon yeah. dating, right? And so when the tree is burned or destroyed, it releases all that. Released, yeah. Right. So not only is the fire and the smoke and, and the burning and those gases going into the atmosphere, but also all the carbon that's going in mm -hmm. into the atmosphere. Um, and we're nearing our limit um, when it comes to carbon, atmos um, carbon um, and greenhouse gases. And what other, what also happens too that some people don't understand is, is can you explain maybe how, how cows, even produce um, a greenhouse gas in, at all. Yeah, I mean, cows, um, I'm not 100% sure if it's the, the farting or the belching or the combination of the two, but cows, cows release a ton of methane, which is uh, just as bad, if not worse, than, than carbon dioxide uh, into the atmosphere. And, you know, like I was saying earlier, 60% of the animals on the earth are cows and pigs and chickens so like we, we we can we can stop this by just not breeding them into existence and the first thing that we need to do to not breed them into existence is not pay for it to not put a demand um uh, on the on the products yeah is there anything else that um maybe strikes you as as highly alarming when it comes to um the effects of animal agriculture and the environment that maybe you want to share. Yeah, um, probably like seeing the, seeing the waste pits, smelling it. Um, so one of the first actions that I partook in, I was actually arrested <laughs> like two months after going vegan, uh, was in, was in Tar Heel, North Carolina. Uh, I'm not sure if you're aware of this, but that's the large, it's the largest pig slaughterhouse in the world. Eastern North Carolina has, um, like one of the highest population density of, of slaughterhouses, and pig operations, hog operations. And just being outside of this facility where 33,000 pigs are killed every day, the smell of it is so horrible. It's so terrible. It just smells like death in, in feces and in urine. It's just combination. It's so horrible. And these, the other issue that we haven't talked about, and it, I can kind of be tied in with environmentalism, 
Are you there? Connection stable. Okay. Yeah. So another issue that's tied in with this, I'm not sure if you heard the term environmental racism. Yeah. Yeah. So like specifically in Eastern North Carolina, these slaughterhouse operations are disproportionately placed in minority areas, minority black, minority Hispanics, where these people are then working in these, these facilities. These people are subjected to airborne diseases from the shit that's just sprayed everywhere. Well, the, you know, this animal waste gets into the groundwater. Um, some of these particles can travel miles into the air. Um, there's been, uh, you know, documentaries showing people's houses coating with, coated with animal feces that live miles away from these, these operations. Um, so obviously, like, we're destroying the, uh, the actual trees, actual planet, actual land to create space for animals, but we're also putting humans into really unfavorable positions where they then not, can't get out of because these people now, their property value is so low. Nobody wants to live there, they, and they can't leave because they, they don't have any money or anywhere to go. So there's, there's so many issues that um, are tied in with this animal agriculture uh, problem. It just, it just doesn't make sense to continue paying for, for these products. Yeah, something else about the hog farms uh, that's, that's, and the, the feces and the cesspools um, is what happens when they break and what happens when they overflow and what happens when it rains and what happens when there's a hurricane and what happens yeah. to all that feces. And, and, and it all runs into the rivers and it runs into yep. the rivers and it runs into the ocean. And it's killing the fish and it's causing, causing the ocean dead zones and the acidification of the oceans. I remember I lived in, I lived in Houston for three years in Houston, Texas. And I lived, uh, my, I had a girlfriend at the time and she lived in Galveston. Are you familiar with Galveston? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So it's just South of Houston. It's a little, it's a little Island. So she lived there. So that's why I would go there. And, um, but Galveston is famous for the hurricanes and getting, bombarded by hurricanes yep. one of the i think one of the worst hurricanes in the history of the u.s i think was hit galveston and uh so anyways um i remember going to galveston and i remember um going to the water and i love the beach i'm from san diego of course i love the beach right and so i remember i was like i want to get in the water and people were like don't get in the water and i'm like what do you mean they're like you see that what it looks like and i'm like yeah, it's pretty brown. They're like, yeah, you sh it just rained. And like, you shouldn't get in there. I'm like, well, what does that mean? Like, it just rained. Like, what's the big deal? And they're like, every time it rains, um, it's very dangerous to go in the water. Nobody goes in the water. They know not to go in the water. And at the time, I didn't think anything of it. I just remember it was as brown as almost as far as I could see. But I didn't, I didn't know why. I'm just wow. like, just, don't get in it. And like, okay. I mean, if you live here and you don't want to get in it, heck no, I'm not going to get in the water but it yeah. smelled oh, wow. really bad. It smelled like shit, right? And, it's, but I didn't know, like, who, I just thought it came from humans. I'm like, I guess it's us. But it didn't hit me until I was watching a documentary about, about how the runoff from the farms in the middle of the US. So the middle of the US is really the highest density of, of animal agriculture, right? And so, you know, the, the dairy farms from Wisconsin and the beef farms all across, you know, Oklahoma and all the, all the middle of the U.S., right? Yeah. Uh, and so that runoff goes all the way down into the ocean. The largest dead zone is in the Gulf of Mexico, right? And so yeah, uh, that, that, and everything. that runoff is killing the ocean and killing the, the, all the fish that live in there. They can't breathe. Um, it's, it takes away all the oxygen and they just die. And it's not seen because it's under the water and we don't, we don't really think that we're affecting it because out of sight, out of mind. Uh, Outside out of mind. Yeah. I went down to, um, uh, I don't remember what the name of the hurricane was last year, but it hit Eastern North Carolina and all of those hog farms and chicken farms were underwater, totally inundated. 
and I flew my drone over it. I have some of the footage on um, on my YouTube page, but just it's just shit water everywhere, everywhere. So disgusting. Like you're saying, it that that made its way to to the to the East Coast, out to the oceans, and that's where you get these these algae blooms, and you get all these dead fish up on the up on the shore from from factory farm animal waste. It's, just, it's insane. It's so crazy. But this is also our drinking water. This is also what yeah. we need to survive. I think people don't realize the most precious resource on the entire planet. I mean, it's debatable. Oxygen and water. And without yeah. those two, nothing happens. Nothing goes on. There is no life. And, and it's not like we have a lot of fresh water going around. Uh, so so the, the need to pollute it you know, for, for our taste buds and the need to pollute it for, for profit uh, is, is, is just beyond, beyond us. So people think that veganism is all about the animals. Yes, that's the definition and that's what we fight for. But this is as much a human rights issue as much yep. as is animal rights issue. It causes more damage to humans, not even including health. Um, that's a whole nother story in trillions of dollars in health, um, health related um, care. But not even talking about that, just, just the pure, like logical things that you can see and logical things that you happen of just precious resources. Uh, and that's why it's a human rights issue. You could go boil it down to the workers in the factories and, and the PTSD that they have and the murder rates and how high they are um, in, the, in the areas where, where there's high amounts of slaughterhouses and, you know. Like the, you know, a lot of the people around the world that are, are the least well off, that, you know, have the least financial resources um, are the ones being hit hardest by the increased frequency and increased power of a lot of these storms. I mean, look at the, the Bahamas, you know, just after this, uh, this past one, just, just completely destroyed. Like, who knows when that'll be fixed or if it'll even be fixed. Puerto Rico with, has still, still not recovered. Right. Puerto Rico still not when they will. They're projecting a hundred years to get to where they were. That's yeah. Like, that's absolutely crazy. But you're right yeah. about the the ones that are um, the least well off that are going to be affected um, the most. They they least well off and had the least part in it. More yeah. normally, yeah. Their yeah. lifestyle. Their lifestyle. You know. They weren't eating, they're not eating meat, cheese, you know, and eggs Double every bacon day. cheeseburgers. Yeah, yeah they're not happened. eating. They're, they're, you know, people that have low financial resources are normally eating primarily plants. And that's another common thing that I hear, argument against veganism is like, oh, veganism is expensive. No, it's not. People in, in third world nations, you know, I, I lived in Honduras for a while. They're, they're not eating a ton of meat. They're eating primarily plants because it's a lot cheaper than meat. Same thing, you know, in Africa and India, a lot of vegetarians, people not eating a ton of meat. This whole meat heavy thing exists for, um, is a primarily Western thing and exists a lot in part due to government subsidies, which yep. I personally, you know, it sucks because my tax dollars are going to fund an industry that I'm against. Yeah, I want to touch on something that you said about the least well off. So um, in, the, in the continued rise of the global warming and the melting of the ice caps and the increase in the flooding and, and all the hurricanes that we talk about, as those things increase, and, and they will, there's, there's no sign of them slowing down. The two countries that are going to be hit the worst, number one, India, is going to have the most damage and the most devastation. Number two is the United States. So those are the two that are going to be hit the most. As far as like financial the, uh, and the amount of people affected, of the U.S. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Florida and South Carolina and Georgia. Yeah, California too. Like, uh, I mean, yeah, the hurricanes hit those, but I mean, the flooding in the middle of the U.S. as well. You know, yeah. and the droughts. Like, it, there's a lot. There's a lot to it for sure of things that affect it. You know, the the droughts will be longer and the floods will be heavier. Every degree Celsius of increase, um, the atmosphere can hold 10% more water. 10% more water is absolutely crazy, first of all. Um, second of all, that means 
that the water is in the air longer. That means it's not on the ground. That means it's not raining. That means it's not where you need it. It's, it's in the atmosphere. The second thing is when it finally does release, it's a 10% more for every degree Celsius. And we've already oh. hit, we've already hit one degree um, Celsius increase um, since the pre-industrial. So right now in this moment, we are 10% more water in the atmosphere. So that means the drought are going to be increased. And, and as that temperature changes, the, the projection of the, of the rains starts to change. So areas that either got rains and they expected the rains around this time of the year, the, the yearly monsoons, those are already changing. They're already in different locations. Um, Bangladesh and Nepal and, and Northern India have been hit by some of the worst flooding uh, they've ever seen um, already. And that's part of the monsoons changing and being heavier. They're not supposed to land there. They're supposed to be elsewhere. <laughs> right. uh, and so it's, uh, it's pretty crazy. I think the feedback loops, you've heard about feedback loops. Yeah. Yeah, I think that one is those are those are not in the models. So those aren't in the projection. So a feedback loop, like, for example, like, uh, let's say that yeah, the, it's a, a point of no return, like a irreversible tipping point. But even before that, even before it's like irreversible, it's just like, for example, like uh, the, the earth heats up, let's say one degree Celsius. Well, now things are melting that we didn't even know were there or, or yeah. didn't even affect like the permafrost in Canada right? Because yeah. that's nearby. So that permafrost is melting, which is releasing carbon dioxide More and methane gas. gases. It's also sinking, right? Um, the land, which is not really the worst thing. The worst thing is the gases that are coming out that aren't even factored into the models, the climate models, you know, that show how much is in the atmosphere. And some people say it's fake news and it's, it's not real. And we can measure this stuff. Like these things are measurable. They're not, yeah, it's, it's, it's a, like a, estimation on what the damage will be like or when a hurricane will hit or when a flood will happen or a drought but what isn't isn't talked about is there's things that we can easily measure these things even the ice people say how do you know about the carbon in the ice you can see it you can see people, measuring, seen it. people have been doing this type of measurements forever like this this isn't new science it's just it's it's people's own guilty conscience at the end of the day, not wanting to recognize what's happening and not wanting to, to do anything about it, not wanting to change. That's, that's, that's what it is to me at the end of the day, I feel. People just not wanting to take any kind of personal responsibility. Yeah, it's tough. It's tough. I mean, it, it, it takes a lot of courage to say, to stand up and say, you know what? I'm not going to just be like everyone else. I'm going to, I'm going to, to do what's right. And I always say this all the time. I don't know. It's a quote that I, I saw recently. Wrong is wrong, even if everyone is doing it. And right yep. is right, even if nobody's doing it. Yeah. And, uh, and I think it, it rings true to a lot of things that we do. So um, I want to um, give you an opportunity. Is there anything that you want to share that we didn't talk about or something that we did talk about that you just don't want anyone to forget? Um, I... So something that I personally advocate for, and I think I touched on it just a little bit, was um, just to bring it back to, to ethics, was, was speciesism. And I think that's a, that's a term that needs to be used more often. Um, people need to talk about it more often. And people need to hear it more often. Um, so speciesism, if you're not familiar, it's just like sexism, racism, or, or homophobia, uh, it's the assumption of human superiority that has led to the exploitation of non-human animals and it's discrimination. It's the first form of discrimination that we learn and peace amongst human beings will never coexist with speciesism. As long as we're mass murdering and massacring animals, we'll do the same type of thing to each other. In addition to all of the environmental devastation that, that we've talked about, in addition to all of the health that, you know, implications that it's causing. Um, you know, we can't expect the world to become a better place. We can't expect the world to change if we're not willing to kind of step outside of ourselves and examine our own behavior. And, um, you know, speciesism is at the heart of, you know, the climate issue. Speciesism is, is at the heart of the healthcare crisis. Speciesism is at the heart of the, you know, discriminatory battles within our own selves. So, um, I definitely recommend people to, you know, acknowledge their speciesist bias and do something about it. 
Yeah, absolutely. I love that brother. So where can people find you? If people want to see what you're doing, they want to follow your journey. They want to see some of the cool footage that you're shooting and some of the fun activities. Where can they yeah, find you? Uh, it's uh, my Facebook, Instagram, uh, Twitter. It's all the same. It's skinny vegan, but the I is a one and the A is a four. And so it's S K one N N Y V E G four N. And I'm not going to go super into uh, my plans for next year, but I am going to be taking a significant time away from work. I've been stashing a lot of money, been working a lot this year. And I'm going to be blending my running with my activism. We call it tractivism. That's going to happen uh, next year. So I'm not going to go into a lot of details, but uh, that's kind of my uh, plans in the short term, long term, if you will. Nice. That's super cool. I like that. Kind of like uh, Fiona Oaks. Yeah. Yep. You watch that Blending. one, running, running for Good? Yeah. Blending... Uh, Blending her, uh, you know, athletic ability with, with activism. Yeah, you seen her documentary? I haven't seen her documentary, no. Oh my gosh, it's made by the same creators of Cowspiracy and What the Health. What's it called? It's called Running for Good. Running for Good, okay. It's amazing, and, and one thing I like about it, real quick, I'm not going to spoil it or whatever, oh. but sh she says, she says that she's like, I don't even like running. I don't like running at all. I'm not even a runner. Um, but she wins like crazy competitions of like long distance. She's like, I don't even like running. I just want to, I just want to do, I just want to win so that I can speak up for the animals. And she runs an animal sanctuary. Like yeah. that's it. She runs to speak up for her animals. Like that's literally yeah. it. And you, and you look the way she talks and you're like, she's not joking. Like she's dead serious. And you watch the way she runs and like her form is bad. And like, like, I don't even know how she does it. Like it's kind of, it's really crazy. And she has like a, she had a crazy issue with her knee um, when she was young. And like they said, she was never going to walk again. And like for her to run in the climates and the terrain she's run in the distances is beyond me. Like I cannot believe it when I watch yeah. it. I, can, I seriously can't believe um, the amazing things that she does. Yeah. If, if um, kind of along that, you know, in a similar vein, if you have, any kind of, you know, uh, secret talent or something that you're really passionate about outside of environmentalism or animal rights, blend the two. Like, use that platform to, to draw attention to, to the issue, you know? Um, I, I, I've had an idea. I haven't actually acted on it, but, you know, starting a Twitch stream and, and playing video games and trying to, you know, to talk to people about animal rights on there, you know, just, just something silly. Um, if you're, you know, play the guitar, you know, uh, make some songs up about, you know, animal rights. Uh, there's, there's so many things that you can do. And again, support everyone and everyone, no matter what they're doing, whether it's uh, disruptions or Twitch streams or, or, or running or making music or whatever it is you want to do or that your friends are doing, support them and, and do it and and don't don't wait until there's some perfect time you know don't wait until you get this piece of equipment or 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 that piece of equipment or you feel like you know right now is not good maybe next month no just fucking do it just just start doing it you'll get people that will like what you're doing and and and, and you'll and you'll get better and you'll grow with it yeah it, you're absolutely right i love that you say that and i I want you to do that Twitch stream. I want to see that. I'm serious. I know that you're saying you're putting it out there, but I would love to see that. I would love to see you on the headset playing the game. And then I would love to see you saying, Hey, so what do you think about eating animals or, or do you, are you vegan or however you want to start your question? You can just do it like yeah. anonymous for the vice voiceless style, you know, and have that conversation while they're playing. Um, and I think you can get a lot of good content. I think it'd be yeah. a lot of fun. And, and it's, it's about tackling issues and, and there's so many opportunities out there and it is about trying everything. When I started this podcast, I, I mean, my really first episode was just on my phone. I just had my phone yeah. and an app and I just talked into the phone and nothing. Right. I didn't have any recording or anything, but then I added a new microphone and then I added um, the laptop. Yeah. And I didn't even know I could do a podcast 
from someone in the US while I'm in Kuwait, I was like, F, I can only talk to Kuwaitis. Like, who am I going to talk to? I don't even care. Right. I'm going to start. Yeah. But then someone that was doing a podcast said, hey, I want to I interview you on a podcast. And, and he was in um, Austin, Texas. And I was like, how's that going to work? Like, yeah, he's like, oh, we'll just do it on the, on, on the, on the computer. And I was like, awesome. okay, yeah. let's, I was like, let's try it. We did it. And I was like, I like that. That's great. And then I was like, shoot. Now I opened up my, and now I've done, this is probably like my 10th one like, online. Uh, so it just opened up the door uh, to yeah. more people and things that I didn't think were possible. And even the YouTube, my very first YouTube video was my phone, no stand, uh, recording me, no microphone, horrible lighting. I wasn't even talking loud enough. Uh, and I just uploaded it. And, and what you learn is you watch, because of course you're going to watch. If you're doing your own edits, you're going to watch yourself. You're like, I could do that better. Mm, I could improve yeah, there. Exactly. The thing I hate about myself for when I critique myself right now is I, I don't know if you've heard it. I'll say, all right, or okay. And I'm just like, ah, oh, don't say that. And I forget about it until I'm doing the editing. I'm like, why did I, why am I saying okay? Like, yeah, there's, a, there's, a, there's a few things that I like, I'll say kind of over and over again that when I watch it, I'll, you know, and I should stop saying that or some, you know, something along those lines. And one of them is like, I'll, I'll always say like hundred percent, you know, like instead of like, I feel you or, um, I totally, I'm totally in agreement. My, my thing that I always say is like hundred percent, but you know, maybe I'll just keep it. Like, that's my thing. 100, keep it 100, you know? Yeah. Keep it 100. All right. Yeah, great. So we, we can't end this without talking about your shirt. What does your shirt say? Oh, uh, March to close off slaughterhouses. I got it. Um, I got it when I was out in Berkeley, uh, California, uh, at the uh, the Animal Liberation Conference. If you're interested in, uh, I'll plug the, I'll plug that conference because I think it's probably one of the best things that you can go to to learn about uh, activism, get trained on different actions, learn about past nonviolent movements, learn about nonviolence. Uh, Every, it's in the end of May in Berkeley, California, where DXC is kind of headquartered. They have a big conference, it's like 10 days long. And it's a mix of trainings and actions. And the, there's always one like mass action at the end of the conference. So this year, a bunch of activists like chain themselves to the entrance of this duck slaughterhouse in, Cal in Petaluma, California. Some people went in and rescued ducks out of the slaughterhouse. There was just a huge mass vigil out front. But yeah, I bought this shirt while I was out there at the, um, at the conference. They have uh, uh, an animal rights center that DXC runs there and they sell, you know, shirts and drinks and snacks and everything. And it also serves as kind of like a community hub for uh, meetings and things that they have there. So yeah, look up DXC, uh, look up, you know, what they're doing. And if you're in the USA, uh, that conference that they have every year is a great place to not only learn and train, but also uh, network with other people and meet other people. So I've met a lot of people there and, and have drawn a lot of inspiration from people that I've, I've met while I was out there. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, brother. All right, well, I had a great time with you. I'm glad you took time uh, in such short notice uh, to share uh, your knowledge and the things you're doing. Uh, keep up the great work. I'll definitely be rooting for you along the way. I'll be um, hopefully back Likewise, in the States. Man. I'll hopefully be back in the States and I'll get a chance to join you. Um, I'm incredibly eager to join. I, I remember I had an opportunity to do a, um, Anonymous for the Voice List, the very first one in Tel Aviv. I was on vacation. I'm like, I'm going to do this. And then I went and did another one in Bali when I was in Bali. And I was like, I'm going to do this. Um, so I'm all for it. Uh, I just, Kuwait is not a place um, that accepts that. Uh, they have a zero tolerance for any disobedience at all. Uh, oh, so even, even a static demo? Yeah. Oh my gosh. It's, uh, it's interesting. Um, yeah. But yeah. Probably it's, a whole uh, podcast conversation, huh? Say it again? Probably a whole other podcast conversation, huh? Yeah, I'm for going. sure. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> All right, brother. Well, take care. Um, I'll be looking forward to seeing uh, new stuff soon. And I can't wait. Yeah, man. Stay hungry for knowledge, not animals. Choose peace.
Yes, absolutely. Have a great one. Yeah, take care. I ain't eating no beef, no pork, no fish, no chicken. Now people think I'm tripping cuz I ain't eating no dairy, no eggs. But I stay well fed off the fruits and the veg cuz I care about the animals and the environment. I care about my health if it ain't vegan, I ain't buying it. I care about the planet if it does, then we go die with it. People hating veganism without even trying it. It is not a diet if you think it is, then you are wrong. It's a way you're living where we choosing to reduce the harm. Then we cost the others, not only those in the human form. Cuz humane slaughters about as real as a unicorn.